Live from New York City, it's The Gary Knoll Show. And now, your host, Gary Knoll. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Knoll, on the road, completing three separate documentaries, all important, all on environmental or human nature issues. They'll be aired over the next 12 months plus one that is now complete, and I'm going to wait till I return off the road to New York to do a worldwide premiere. Today, the latest on health and healing, and and also since we've had so many very important and intense conversations with Danny Sheehan, Chris Hedges, I've done three commentaries this week. I thought I'd lighten it up a bit, but still give important insights. For example, Professor Jordan Peterson, on what every parent should know. And I'm going to begin a five-part series. Each part will be 10 minutes with Professor Peter Gochi. Now, he's an MD, PhD, and is considered one of the finest physicians, philosophers, ethicists in the world. He also was one of the founders of the Cochrane Group, which had been up to now until it, uh, one of its main divisions was purchased by none other than the second wealthiest man in America, and uh, that's unfortunate. So I no longer trust it, but until this time, it's been spot on. And he's going to talk about why few patients benefit from orthodox therapy and many are harmed. Now, mind you, this is someone at the epicenter of respect and influence as both policymaker and opinion leader within the medical community worldwide. He, he goes beyond any American physicians. He is respected everywhere. So we're going to hear from him at a lecture that he gave at a university to medical students, part one of a five-part uh, series. And also next week I'll be airing a, a program on free speech. What is the cost of free speech today? So that's what you have coming. But we always begin with the latest on health and healing. This is from the University of South Australia, and it talks about stroke. Now, if you've had a stroke, and they're urging you now to do something different, practice yoga and Tai Chi. Tai, T-A-I, Chi, C-H-I. So this is one of Australia's biggest health issues, and it could help people all over the world hooking up with yoga or Tai Chi and reducing blood pressure. Stroke costs countries a lot. It's the second major cause of death in the United States. Heart disease is first heart attacks and then stroke and then behind that's cancer. An article published on looking at 56,000 Australians last year, and they found that they're having one stroke every nine minutes. We're having one stroke in America about every 30 to 40 seconds, and microstrokes that aren't even accounted for because a microstroke, you just may feel lightheaded. You may start to stand up and have to sit down again. You may even do a temporary little blackout for a matter of seconds or a minute. And frequently this happens after exertion or arguments. I've actually had this in my own extended family where my older brother had multiple micro strokes uh, because he would, you know, he would uh, raise his voice about something, and it it only was later after this was diagnosed that he probably had five or ten micro strokes a day. So he had to be very calm after that, and he was, and that helped him. But most people are not aware that when you get angry, when you scream, when you yell, you're really putting yourself at risk for a stroke. Now, this was published in the peer-reviewed journal Future Neurology by researchers at Monash University and the University of South Australia and also the University of Melbourne. So what they're saying is this, mindfulness-based meditation or yoga or tai chi can have a very positive effect of reducing hypertension, reducing fatty acids, reducing your blood sugar level. All three of those are risks for stroke. 
And that's easy to do. And we could do that right in the United States as well as they're doing it there. From the University of Ruvera, Vigorelli in Italy, they found that a hypocaloric Mediterranean diet and daily exercise is all you need to maintain weight loss. I'm sure many of you have either personally struggled with weight gain, especially as you get older, and especially among women who are postmenopausal. Even when you say, Gary, I, I don't understand it. I have not been overeating. You don't have to overeat. Once your hormones shift, the balance between testosterone, progesterone, and estrogen, your metabolism slows down. As it slows down, even if you eat the same identical amount of weight that kept you trim, you're now going to be gaining anywhere from 3 to 9 pounds extra per year. In fact, it was about, I think, around 8 years ago or 9 years ago now, I did a a study. It was the second study, clinical study, I did on a lifestyle intervention with 500 women who were undergoing menopause, and some were postmenopause, and they suffer from a myriad of conditions, thinning of the eyebrows, balding, premature gray wrinkling, creepy skin, um, all forms of viruses and infections, urinary tract infections, thinning and chafing of the mucous membranes in the vagina, uh, constipation, insomnia, fatigue, uh, fungus under the nails. I mean, when you see all this happening and one happens and then another happens and another happens, you begin to appreciate how how finite life is. And when we're younger, we can think, well, I'm 20. I'm, I got a lot of time to go. And when we're 30, you think optimistically, okay, there are people who are living to be 90. I'm going to live to be 90, so I'm only one-third through my life. And then when you get 45, you think, wow, even 40, I'm halfway through my life. And then you hit 50 and think, uh-oh, I'm on the downside of, side of this slippery slope. And by the time you hit 65 or 70, then you start seeing in too many people this sense of finality, this sense of a forlornness, of if only. And in fact, the older we get in our society, this is not universally true throughout the world from my travels, but here it is. We're a very lonely society. Even when we're younger, we're lonely. Even with all the likes and friends on Facebooks, who are, which is all meaningless, we're lonely. Even when you're in relationships and even have children, you can still be lonely. And for multiple reasons. But then we start thinking about, if we know we're all going to die, and we are, and no one gets out of life alive, and they don't, then why in the world should we spend so much time doing nothing essential with the time that we do have, as precious as it is? That's the rub. I have a lot of physicians and nurses who are friends, and some of the friends I have who are nurses are in hospice care. And generally, when you go into hospice care, you go in for the last days or weeks, maybe a couple months of your life. And more often than not, the people are in pain and they're given opiates, so it's this bizarre notion that you want to get people out of pain, but then you also put them in a, a diminished cognitive state. I've seen it, you know, where people didn't recognize their own loved ones because the opiates affect their cognition. There's a whole different way of doing it. In one of my projects this year, in fact, I'm having a meeting at 1 o'clock today, to see about doing exactly that, opening the first holistic hospice uh, and assisted living center in the world and showing in one year how we can take people who are near death and bring them back to vital life, knocking a decade or more off their aging. It's never been done. Now, that doesn't mean it can't be done, and I believe it can be. Anyhow, it's an important project, but, but my point is that Wow, do we waste so much of our life with meaningless conversations, with meaningless gestures, with uh, doing nothing that's essential to our being, including intentionally not making positive choices and always rationalizing everything. And so we end up 
looking in a mirror one day and we get depressed because we don't like what we see. Well, once you get depressed, then you're going to do comfort eating and, and continue gaining even more weight. And so we then use almost exclusively the negative part of our, our consciousness to justify why we have a right to feel bad about ourselves that day or bad about something. And of course, none of that helps ever with anything. And so it took a study outside the United States, one that uh, the researchers from the Human Nutrition Unit at the University of uh, Virilidi in collaboration with 23 other research groups around the world to simply say all you have to do is eat a Mediterranean diet, which is principally a plant-based diet, lots of grains and nuts and seeds and legumes and fresh vegetables and fruits, berries, and, uh, and exercise. It's not that difficult. Two things, that's it. And you can substantially reduce your risk of gaining weight because when you gain weight, everything changes. Your opportunity for a heart attack, a stroke, cancer, diabetes, and depression all increase substantially. So that's just the latest study. Reduce your risk of dying prematurely and of aging like everyone else by being that exception. Now, is it possible in the next five or ten years with all the new science that's occurring in genetic therapy to extend the life measurably to actually reverse aging of cells and organs. Yes, it is. In fact, it's actually being done. It's just the public's not aware of it yet. But it is, and one of the projects I'll be working on after the current projects are complete is my newest film on how we can reverse aging or add at least 30 additional years onto our age. So suddenly that clock that keeps ticking and the sands pouring out can be re reset. But that'll come with new information in the next 12 months. Kombucha, com, K-O-M, bucha, B-U-C-H-A, prepared from ginger, can help treat breast cancer. This is from Azad University in Iran, published in the Journal of Complementary and Integrative Medicine, and kombucha and ginger can help treat breast cancer. And uh, they go into the abnormal metabolism is a hallmark of cancer cells. And they found a you know, whole set of research that they did on kombucha tea made from ginger, which increases its antioxidant capacity. And it, it destroyed breast cancer cells. Now, again, it's not a cure-all. But I want you to start, if you have breast cancer, to consider kombucha and ginger tea together. But I would go a couple steps further because I've read other research as well. I would use, in that kombucha tea, I would use five to 6,000 milligrams of, of um, turmeric's most important and powerful active ingredient. I would also use vitamin C, lemon juice, would be important as well, and quercetin. All of those can help with breast cancer. And from Beijing University of Chinese Medicine comes a study about adding a Chinese remedy to conventional medicine to improve cognitive function of Alzheimer's patients. Now, orthodoxy has never been able to reverse, slow down, or even improve Alzheimer's disease. Its degenerative effects can be slowed down or even halted through treatment with specialized medicines, but not reversed. We've done that. They have it, and they've shown no interest in seeing what we do because ours is not financially based or proprietary. And so the Chinese have come up with some natural, traditional herbal remedies to work with the orthodox approach. And I thought that was important, and one of them it, that is easy to get come by is grapes, grape seed, grape skin.